Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bola Musa, moderator today for our, uh, this ARM hosted session entitled Alternative IPO Strategies for Cell and Gene Therapies. Special thanks to ARM and our management uh, for having us. Uh, as some of you may know, I'm Chief Science Officer and Executive Chairman of Chardon Healthcare Acquisition 2 Corp, a publicly traded SPAC. I'm participating today solely in that role. I'm also joined uh, by three uh, people on the panel. Uh, first is Stephanie Sirota. Uh, who's VP of Corporate Strategy and Corporate Communication for Health Sciences Acquisition Corp 2. She's also a partner and chief business officer at RTW, which is a dedicated healthcare fund with approximately 3.7 billion in assets under management. Uh, RTW is focused on identifying transformational innovations across the life sciences space. Uh, second panelist is Yvonne Claude Pierre who's a partner at Cooley, where he advises clients on a wide range of capital markets transactions, including IPOs, SPACs, debt and equity offerings, M&A, and other significant global corporate transactions. So over his uh, 25 years or so in practice, he's counseled US and foreign pub publicly traded and privately held life sciences, healthcare tech, and other innovative companies, uh, as well as investment banking firms, private equity sponsors, and venture capital firms. Von Claude has been named to the Global Networks M&A Lawyers list of the world's top 50 M&A lawyers and, an, and is also recommended by the Legal 500 for capital markets transactions. Uh, and then we also have Jonas Grossman, uh, who's a partner and president of Chardon, where he oversees the firm's banking and capital markets activities. Under uh, uh, Jonas's leadership, Chardon's become one of the most notable underwriters, advisors, and sponsors of SPACs. Uh, having underwritten 79 transactions, raising 10.4 billion uh, with zero liquidations. Chardon's also served as advisor to 18 SPAC transactions. Um, so Chardon also um, has, uh, Mr. Grossman's also been at Chardon as president and CEO uh, uh, overseeing the six sponsored SPAC, uh, which is Chardon Healthcare Acquisition 2 Corp. Um, so why don't we uh, go right into this panel and we'll start with Yvonne Claude. Can you just first of all give us an overview, please, of SPACs and what they are? Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and thank you for all the panelists uh, for participating here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, everybody, there's a lot of buzz in around SPACs, and um, SPACs are basically a blank check company, a newly organized corporation um, that offers basically securities uh, to fund acquisitions for a yet to be determined um, business. Usually it, the SPAC has about 24 months in which to find the target, um, but the company actually has no operations, um, no active operations and files, you know, an F1 or an S1 and basically goes public and raises funds. Generally speaking, the investment in SPACs are an investment in a management team um, with it either in a sector or a management team that sort of has done this product before. All right, thank you. So Stephanie, obviously RTW has been prominent in the space. Why did RTW decide to do a SPAC um, and, and even a second one? Yeah, um, so we talked to Chardon who brought us the wonderful idea and educated us on what a SPAC is. We, at the time, this was in early 2019, and we recognized that, you know, this is potentially a wonderful counter-cyclical tool. If there's going to be vo volatility in the market, uh, preemptively sort of betting against uh, volatility in the healthcare space with the upcoming election, we thought this would be a great way for companies to, you know, avoid um, some of that capital markets risk. And uh, we ended up doing a SPAC last year. Uh, we did a great deal with a wonderful company and couldn't have predicted how successful that actually turned out to be. And we decided that actually, whether it's a good market or a challenging environment, a SPAC is a great tool for companies. So we decided to do our second. Great. And Jonas, why, why don't you talk about uh, your involvement of SPACs over the years and um, sort of what brought you to uh, be involved in biotech SPACs specifically? Sure. So, so Chardon, as, as an investment bank, has actually been involved with the SPAC product since 2004. The third SPAC ever was called Chardon China Acquisition. And so we got involved really as a pioneer in the space from a, a management sponsor pers perspective and have proceeded to do 
a number of other ones uh, since then. We've also become an active underwriter and advisor. Um, and the space is, has really accelerated kind of broadly, I think, to put things in perspective. In this past year, there have been about 45% of the total IPO market has been SPAC. So it's really kind of taken a, a, taken a life of its own because it does solve some, some problems that private companies uh, want to address as they think about going public. Um, Chardon got involved around biotech SPACs because we were at a biotech practice. We were speaking with a lot of private companies who were active in the SPAC space. And we noticed that, that really uh, high quality venture backed uh, private companies, when they look to try to go public, often had to go through the exercise of a crossover round before the IPO itself. I think that was really a function of the IPO space needed to do a bunch of diligence ahead of time. And so often you had sort of two steps in order to get to that, to that go public transaction. And we thought that SPACs could be an innovative tool to, to be a value creator for, for private companies that, that may want to accelerate that pathway and, and think about really bringing the same investors that you might get in a crossover round or anchor investors in an IPO directly into a listed entity um, immediately. And so uh, we were fortunate enough to, to work with, with RTW on, on one of the early SPACs and, in, in fact, underwrote uh, one for ourselves as well. Um, in, and I think in the early days, it was really more of an exercise in explaining what a SPAC is. It's now really taken an acceleration, I think, in large part due to the success of Immunivan, what RTW was able to create with, with their SPAC and really showed share price performance and, and, and took a really high quality company that could, had any option available to it from financing and, and, and showed that the SPAC could really work effectively. And so, um, you know, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about this on the panel, but we're really excited to see that the SPAC products sort of take off more broadly within the space. Just from your experience, I mean, why, why was it thought that maybe biotech wasn't the right industry, uh, cell and gene therapies, genetic medicines? Why, 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 why did people hesitate to use SPACs in that space? And obviously, something must have changed. So could you talk about that a bit? So, um, you know, I think it's, it was innovative, right? And so there was a pathway where private companies it worked. They did crossover rounds, they got good anchor investors, and then they went public and, and they got good support. Like any new idea, I think, you know, boards and management teams want to see some case studies as it, as it plays out. And, um, you know, we're fortunate now we've had four announced deals and now another 11 that have gone public or have filed to go public within the, the biotech space. So there's some good momentum around that. Um, and, you know, I think folks are getting to understand a little bit more and understand that it could be uh, the right tool for certain private companies. The, 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 the more straightforward pathway is still available, of course, but the SPAC could accelerate things, get them a good de-risk transaction, which might be interesting for, for some companies. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I also think, I mean, I would love to jump in on that. I, I also yeah. think, you know, um, adding to what Jonas said, I also think, you know, as SPACs, healthcare SPACs and biotech SPACs started to track IPO performance um, and, you know, more and more people started to sort of think about alternative ways to go public. I mean, you know, back in the day, and I have, I started doing SPACs way back when, probably with Jonas, back in the early 2000s. And, you know, it was, you would take a company public and it'd be a, a straight public. And then they're kicking this concept of a crossover financing, which basically allowed you to have dilution before additional dilution on an IPO. Um, and I think that, you know, as we had some successful SPAC transactions like Immunivant, um, for instance, that we were involved with, I think that's really made a lot of potential entrepreneurs and, and target companies really think about how do they want to go public and what does the cap table look like post, post transaction, whether it be an IPO or a SPAC. And I think that a lot of companies have looked and said, hey, it's probably better from a dilution perspective um, to do a SPAC instead of an IPO. I'm going to jump in and add to that great answer. Um, the other tool that has been, or the other option has often been a reverse merger. And the SPAC actually presents a cleaner version of the reverse because you don't have to deal with the unwind of an existing shell company. You know, I, think, I think that's a very important point, Stephanie, that, that reverse mergers have been, I think that's really why it's been taking off in biotech, that the investor base is familiar with reverse mergers. There's been, you know, some good ones and some, you know, not so good ones, to be honest, but there have been plenty of them that have actually worked. There's value in the listing, there's value in raising capital and getting a good shareholder base. One of the drawbacks of reverse mergers is that you have to change over the shareholder base after the transaction, while with the SPAC, it's self-cleansing through the actual mechanism itself. Everyone gets to right. do the proxy, meet with management, 
and then make a decision to stay in or not. And the shares of those that don't want to stay in get canceled unless they sell it to someone who does. And so you, you have a clean slate after the DSPAC. And I think that's, that's, super, that's very interesting for, for private companies versus spending a bunch of months trying to figure out how to take out of shareholders that were stuck in the legacy reverse right. merger. Sure. And just an open question to anyone on the panel. I mean, I think the legacy of SPACs, um, you know, 10 plus years ago, people would ask questions about the quality of the sponsor, the, the target, the investors. Has that completely changed? So what, what, what are some data points, uh, if so? I mean, I, I'm happy to sort of jump in. I, I, I think that when, when SPACs, you know, were, were, were when SPACs started, what you had was you had a lot of sort of hedge funds for investing. It was more of like a trade um, where um, I think that they would maybe, you know, redeem out, but, you know, hold, hold their warrant. Um, I think that's changed. I think you've had more fundamental investors sort of investing in SPACs at the outset at the time of the IPO, but also investing in the pipe and sort of doubling down um, and putting more money into the pipe. That has led the, the, the SPAC product to really take off not only – for, for, with a bunch of investment banks um, and a bunch of companies, you know, have sort of interest in that. And I think that, you know, as we started seeing bigger deals, as we started seeing more sophisticated investors come into the product, the product has sort of exploded at this point. And I think that what's interesting is, is usually it's a counter cyclical product where um, back in the old days, you would have, when the IPO market wasn't very hot, you'd have specs. I think what's great right now is that you have two markets that are really, really, you know, clicking on all cylinders. But I do think that, you know, if the market turn and go south a little bit, I think the SPAC product is going to be even more interesting to people than it is right now. And it's right now, it's pretty. I mean, pretty I, I would add to, sorry, didn't you want to go, Stephanie? No, uh, go ahead. Okay, I was going to add to that, uh, Ivan Claude, is that, look, the SPAC product, while it's been around, it, it hasn't really gained in promise as in the last four or five years. Um, it's disruptive. And so it takes a while for folks to understand the change and then people really understand the benefits and drawbacks. I think there was some confusion around SPACs over the years. I think that's gone away. I think that one of the open questions people really want to understand is what is, who's going to redeem? You know, who are the investors that the SPAC at IPO and who's going to stay through the business combination? Once you realize that you can construct deals whereby, you know, certainly in the case of biotech in the last year where the vast majority of the investor base is the exact investors you want to have in your crossover and, and kind of anchor investors in your IPO. It's not to say they're necessarily going to stay through the business combination, but you do get the opportunity to speak with them and they're often staying through. That's very powerful. And so you've seen, um, I think, this disruption play out within biotech. You're also seeing more broadly in the market where you used to have companies stay private for a long time and then go public after the growth phase had matured and had been de-risked. And now you're seeing you know, growth equity and venture seeing that this is an opportunity to take companies that are kind of earlier and take in them out of the public markets a little bit earlier to give the public market investors an opportunity to get on that growth curve earlier on, might be a little bit riskier, but they do want to see that growth. Um, and so you're seeing that play out kind of broadly within SPACs, which is why it's been about half of the IPO market this year. I'd also add that even, you know, it's absolutely right what Jonas said that biotech companies tend to go early, very uh, get tend to go public very early in their life cycle, and with the crossover round, it, it's sort of an essential item to have a blue chip investor who's anchoring that round, and that's exactly what we're replacing in the you know combining the crossover the IPO and then combining those two into one clean spec where you have your anchor and then the blue chip investor, the sponsor is, is building a syndicate of every investor that that company, the target company would want to have. So we're pre-packaging a syndicate that makes it um, very efficient for them to go public through a one-step process. And I think to that end, Stephanie, you're right. If you look at the, the recent sort of half a dozen plus or more, if you look at the first 15, the vast majority were institutional sponsors most of which have significant balance sheets that would be your likely leads on either a crossover or IPO. That's and right. Bringing in the rest of the book. Um, and so that, that I think was really, really attractive for, for private companies. And if they think about an RTW or health sciences too, health sciences is trying to find the most compelling opportunity to put in there. So, you know, you're really not only investing privately, but you're trying to find the, the most compelling one. And so um, I think that has an extra cachet to it as well. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I, I would also add that I think it, 
it de-risks the IPO process, and then that's why this alternative is so attractive. You know, I mean, there are many companies who go public. Not every company gets out. I think with a SPAC, with a SPAC you have a little bit more deal certainty um, so long, you know, as you have the blue chip companies like Stephanie, investors like Stephanie alluded to. Um, so I think that's very, very compelling because you get the same result of a cheap listing and becoming a public company. And on top of that, the investors have an ability to see a little bit more into your company. The SPAC product is a product where, you know, you can put sort of, you know, projections if you want sort of in your S4. And I think that's really compelling that investors have a more of a bird's eye view about what is sort of going on in the company versus an IPO process where certain things are limited. And I think that from that perspective, I think it's a very strong sort of product for the biotech space. All right. So, I mean, I'd imagine that uh, a SPAC versus a reverse merger versus traditional IPO, um, that, you know, one, one, one wouldn't be perfect for every company. So what are the advantages? Let's start with reverse mergers versus SPACs. What are the advantages and disadvantages of a SPAC versus a reverse merger? And then we'll move on to IPOs. Um, maybe we'll start with this one uh, with uh, Jonas. So I touched upon a little bit earlier. I think the, the one advantage with the SPAC or the reverse merge is that um, you, there's a cleansing mechanism. You know what your investor base is going to be through the SPAC. You don't really know what that's going to be the case of the reverse merger. Often with the reverse merger, there may be limited capital on day one. And so you have to do a side-by-side -side financing, which can be a little bit tricky sometimes with disclosures and over the walls and just sort of sequencing that you get. Um, and then you also don't necessarily get um, you know, sort of the, the, the exact layout of the book that you have afterwards, you're kind of guessing a little bit about it because it is, once again, that reverse merge and the existing shareholder base. You know, with the SPAC, you're, you're able to solve for those. So you, you do know what your capital will be uh, at the end of the finish line. Even by the time you sign the merger, you get a good sense of what you will get and who your investors will be. And you'll know what your, uh, who your key investors are and your valuation. So you'll be able to make an informed decision before signing a merger agreement with the SPAC which you wouldn't necessarily be able to do as well with a, with a reverse merger. And I think, you know, adding to that um, is you're getting a partnership with the SPAC. With the reverse merge, it's often, it's now a minority shareholder and they've got conflicting interests between the boards, the existing shareholders, the management teams, and people might have different opinions. A SPAC is a tailor-made product that everyone's incentivized, even those investors who don't want to come into the deal, to have this deal successfully closed because they want to have some value for the ongoing war. And so everyone is incentivized to try to uh, have the transaction move forward as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible. And I think that's a little bit of a differentiator as well. Sure, and Stephanie, uh, Immunovant has, uh, now, it's now I think multiple billions of dollars in market cap. So what were the advantages to health sciences for choosing a SPAC relative uh, to a traditional IPO in this case? Yeah, I mean, we definitely think that the traditional IPO um, is certainly one great path, but the SPAC is really bringing advantages of timing. It relieves a huge burden for the target company because their management team doesn't have to go on a crossover and then an IPO roadshow. Uh, we put a board together for them. And then also, and this is an important point, we can build in incentives that really align us and ensure that we are going to be, like Jonas said, a partner with the company, which you can't do in an IPO. So we think that, that the incentive alignment um, is actually really important because it sort of assures that you know, your sponsor is going to be there for the long haul. And any other advantages or disadvantages versus traditional IPO, uh, Von Claude or Jonas, anything come to mind? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think the SPAC product is also, and Stephanie alluded to, but the SPAC product is also very flexible. Um, and it's more of a negotiation in and around, you know, the business combination of the DSPAC. Um, and I think because of that, there's more flexibility in and around, you know, corporate governance, a little bit, but more around valuation and things along those lines that you probably don't have with a traditional IPO process. You know, um, I think it's a little bit harder. It's sort of what the bankers sort of tell you your valuation is going to be or what the investors are going to say. And so I think that's important. Um, there's also larger pools of capital. I think that also, you know, like I alluded to before, you know, a little bit of forward guidance and a more detailed business model, you know, probably gives sort of investors a little bit more comfort than a traditional IPO. Actually, one point on the investors is 
a lot of investors view this as a way in which they can buy into a hot IPO. Um, with the way that things have been going recently in the capital markets, a lot of investors are being cut out of IPOs um, and even follow on financings. So in some ways, it's really important actually to be there and have that relationship built in. And the SPAC allows an investor to do that and be part of that syndicate. Definitely yeah, a very good point. We're actually seeing in, in other sectors, and I think biotech's a little bit behind sort of other sectors, in tech where the long only mutual funds are taking sizable height positions in companies that, um, you know, if they put in on an IPO, may have got a fraction of that allocation. So they're, they're really using their balance sheet to kind of be involved and get significant positions. And so to Stephanie's point, and I think why you're seeing in biotech only and in no other sector, are there SPACs with no warrants? So in most sectors, in fact, every sector, um, even if you have the highest quality management team with the highest degree of success, you're seeing some fraction of a warrant being involved because it's, it is attracting uh, a number of, uh, you know, of hedge funds and otherwise into it on the IPO. But in the biotech space, the um, take up, I think, from the investing community has been so rapid that people understand they just want to position themselves for the next hot uh, offering that the SPAC team can bring together. They don't even need a warrant for it. So it's, it's interesting to see how that's really become widespread within the biotech space. And, I, and to be fair, I think part of it has to do with the deals are smaller. In some of these other areas, you're seeing 500 to $4 billion deals. So you do have to kind of go broader on who you attract, hence the warrant. But in biotech, it's very concise. These books are often these days, very small fraction of warrant or no warrant and already sitting with the highest quality uh, healthcare investors. Yeah, and I think I think when you when when Stephanie and Joe talk about a hot IPO, I think that you know a, a pr prospective hot IPO, right? I mean, we we were involved with uh, the Open Door deal, the Canoe deal, the Allian deal. So, you know, th those are are, are are potential hot IPOs in the future where investors are, are getting the opportunity to invest now and not necessarily being cut out to the extent that the company goes public. So I, I think you know just to add to what Stephanie and Jonas have just said. Got it. So, I mean, for a company considering a SPAC, obviously there's uh, legal auditing elements uh, that can uh, affect, uh, let's say, how easy or difficult it is. So, Yvonne Clark, could you talk a little bit more about Cooley's involvement in those processes and, and what the key elements are for a successful DSPAC? And, and obviously tell us what DSPAC means as well for those new to the space. Um. Well, a, a DSPAC is when, when an actual target company um, merges with um, a SPAC that's gone public. Um, and the shareholders of the target company end up having shares, you know, sort of in the, the, the remaining merged entity. Um, and they are then a public company, right? And so, you know, I think for, from Cooley's perspective, you know, we we sort of we're the number one law firm with respect to IPOs, with respect to the biotech life sciences and also the tech sector. So as SPACs became, you know, more involved in those sectors, we naturally became extremely very busy with those transactions. But I do think when you think about legal and accounting sort of elements, you know, for a special D SPAC, I don't think it's that much different, right? When you talk about sort of, you know, hot IPOs and, and, and people choosing this alternative path, I think the companies still need to be constructed in a way in which they would be a successful public company um, after the DSPAC, right? And what does that mean? Well, that means, you know, you're going to do um, an S4. I mean, a, a SPAC transaction is two transactions, right? It's, you're doing an S4, you're doing a pipe transaction, you're, account, you're also doing a merger. Um, that being said, you know, when you're an emerging company, if you qualify to be an emerging company and merge into the SPAC, you know, you're going to need two years of financial statements, right? And so who are your accountants? Who are the stubs? Who are your, who are your service providers? It's very critical to have lawyers who have done SPACs, no SPACs, have accountants and investment banks who have experience doing SPACs. It's, it's extremely critical because it's a, you know, like Stephanie alluded to before, it is a shorter path than going public. So the transaction moves very quickly. Um, it could be very complex. And so I think it's sort of important to have that. The other thing I think that's important is considering that you're going to be, after the DSPAC, you're going to be a public company. So you need to have corporate governance in place, the right finance, financials, finance department, HR, IR, PR, same concept is, is, is going public, but you know, you're, you're going to do it in a different alternative path, but the result is that you're a public company. And so the path to public whether it be 
a SPAC or an IPO is very similar. Could you talk a little bit more, Yvonne Claude, about costs and timelines if, you, if a company chooses to go down this route? Well, I mean, as far as costs and timelines, I think that um, I, I wouldn't say that, that a SPAC is, is less expensive than the IPO process, because as I alluded to before, it's sort of three transactions. What I will say, though, is um, you don't necessarily, you don't have the dilution you otherwise would have had if you did a crossover and a sort of a financing. And so when you're, we're talking about the ecosystem, you, it, is, it is not a um, less expensive product. It is actually an equally expensive product because of the fact of all the transactions going on and the resulting. Now, that's also the reason why you experienced bankers, um, investors, and lawyers that have done product. Because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, a pipe investment <laughs> that's going in is by paying for some of the fees and, and, and also from an investment banker perspective. I'm going to talk a little bit about costs. So, I mean, I think the way you should think about it is there's a two costs to a transaction. There is the dilution. So the equity cost, and I think the SPAC very clearly um, is a pathway for much less dilution than taking into account what the sponsor will get from the transaction, simply because you're often saving on a round of financing along the way. And then the second one is costs, like sort of hard cash costs in the transaction. And I think there's two things. I think you've Claude, they, it can be equally as expensive as an IPO, and that's if you decide to bring in a whole suite of fees and kind of do a fully sort of agented transaction versus a more concise one. So there are different approaches there depending on, on how you want to approach it. But I think most importantly is that the costs are very little to explore it, to, to get to an LOI, to understand where the book is, what the valuation is, and is this going to work? It's at that point that a decision is made to spend a lot more on the audit, spend a lot more on you know, the S4, which is the bulk of the cost. And you really only scale that in um, once you have a very good sense that you have a book there. So unlike an IPO where you spend a lot up front and hope for a good result, here you kind of understand where the result's going to be most likely and then kind of figure out how you want to spend the money. So it's a little bit more de-risk in that perspective. Yeah, that's true. The, the cost Just of that. Just touch on the, on the timing. Uh, the, I mean, the timing can be um, a huge saver because normally a sponsor has about 24 months uh, to do this back. But if you have an idea about your sort of short list of targets that you're going to go after, as soon as the negotiations start, you can, you can be sort of done and dusted within a couple of quarters uh, versus the traditional path, which could be six months for a crossover and then, you know, up to a year following that. So you're looking at 12 to 18 months for the traditional process. I might add, this is coming from Health Sciences One that clocked the fastest IPO <laughs> to business combination close in the history of the close to 200 D SPACs. So, That's right. not an easy feat. <laughs> so, I'm sure there are companies out there in particular that want to know uh, how they can uh, become, let's say, potential partners for SPAC sponsors, i.e. they can become targets. So, Stephanie, could you, could you talk about what you're looking for in terms of uh, the ideal target for health sciences? Yeah, sure. So, first of all, the, the SPAC that we end up, um, you know, sourcing and, and the targets for us are within the pool of targets that we're looking at for investments anyway, and um, or, or it could be something that's in our private investment portfolio. Um, to make yourself a viable SPAC uh, target, you really need to be as far along that public ready process as you can be. So, you know, the more um, you have your management team um, all in the right seats, the, if you have um, an IR function, if you have corporate finance capabilities in house, uh, the more public ready you are, the better. Got it. And Jonas, uh, obviously, you're involved as a sponsor as well. Can you, first of all, uh, give sort of that aha moment, um, uh, your, your thinking during the aha moment where you thought, hey, it makes sense to get into SPACs as a sponsor. And then also, as Stephanie did, discuss what you're looking for in terms of a potential target. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the aha moment was really when we were speaking with private companies and they were talking to underwriters to be to see who wanted to be involved with their IPO. And you know, most of the feedback from underwriters look this looks like a great story, but you know, in order for this to be successful and de-risked, you know, you need to put together a crossover round. And so that was highly dilutive, and it took the 12 to 18 months that Stephanie um, you know alluded to. And so since we were so involved in the space, I think a lot of the SPACs had been lar are larger in size. The underwriters always push for bigger deals and the SPAC sponsors often will do that as well because there's a good IRR on that. But you really need to, to size the SPAC appropriately for your target universe. And so I think some of the um, you know, innovation was pulling it back and looking at sort of sub 200 million, sub 150 million in that range to be kind of appropriate with your target universe. In biotech, your typical crossover is sort of 70 odd million and your IPO is about 100. So that's kind of the amount of capital that you're thinking about. I think once folks got their arms wrapped around that, it made a big difference. You know, from our perspective, as far as targets, I mean, we have an $85 million SPAC. So we're looking for anything that's kind of 150 to 200 valuation and upwards. Um, and we can always scale in additional capital outside of what's in, in the trust now. Um, and we're looking for areas where you think you have an edge from a diligence perspective. Genetic medicine is, is a big area of interest for Chardon and, and health sciences as well. And, and so, you know, for us, you know, seeing opportunities there would make a lot of sense. As Stephanie mentioned things that are, that are closer to being ready to being public or, or a little easier to, to digest to the SPAC transaction. Um, but, you know, we're also partners. So whether it's RTW or Chardon or others, we're there to help be constructive and, and build the company. And so maybe that's an advantage to helping you accelerate getting public because we know the company or we really like the assets and we can kind of help along the way. And there's ongoing sort of board assistance and other things that could be helpful. It really is more of a partnership than it is uh, sort of a transactional. No, for sure. I think also um, the more we can see, and it doesn't really matter whether a company has assets that are clinical or preclinical, we're, we're ready to get involved with a company as long as that path to what they plan to do with the growth, growth capital has been defined. So you know, the more comfortable we drug that they're developing, then you know that gives us comfort to to step in and and want to shepherd this company into the next part of their life cycle. Ivan Claude, uh, I mean, Cooley has a tremendous amount of flow uh, in the biotech space. So, what, what, how do you, how do you prioritize clients? What do you use to select uh, who might be able to take on as a SPAC client, so to speak? Well, it's interesting you ask that. I mean, in, in this space, what we've seen is a lot of our clients that were already clients are being approached by SPACs, uh, quite a number, um, and so because of that, you know. Um, we sort of advise the clients on what to look for on, on, on the actual SPAC that they merge with. And, you know, we put out blogs and other things with respect to, um, you know, what are good sort of things and issues that, that a target company should consider, you know, on merging with the SPAC. So I think that from, from that perspective, you know, we, we try to advise our clients on what we've seen in the marketplace because we're so active in the marketplace. And it's interesting because SPACs, you know, the, 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 the the structure of the SPAC or the terms of the SPAC can, can change. Like you said, it's a very flexible product. And so, you know, from time to time, you'll get, you know, calls from somebody like Jonas um, who will have, a, you know, a different concept with respect to the D SPAC and how he can make sure that the SPAC trades better, um, you know, after the D SPAC and other issues that come on. And I think that what I really like about this product is it continues to evolve. Um, I think there, I think also that, like I said before, I think as the world continues to go, whether if you have geopolitical issues, you have an election, you have COVID, you know, you know, biotech companies still need to raise money, right? <laughs> so at the end of the day, this product is going to be a product that's going to be there and available probably a lot longer than sort of the IPO product. IPOs can sometimes come and go. Obviously, we had a great run in the IPO market for biotech companies, um, but to the extent that that you know, wherever to slow down. I do think that the SPAC product will be a product that a lot of our clients and target companies in the biotech space are going to continue to look at. Yeah, I suspect that in the coming months and years, private companies are going to dual track every 
they're thinking about going public and they want to do a crossover and an IPO, they're going to dual track some conversations with SPACs to see if there's an opportunity to kind of accelerate things. Obviously, in every situation is a little bit differently, is a bit different, but I think that that'll be maybe the way that the private companies think about it, that if they really are ready to go public and they want to get there, now sort of the time in the near future that they're going to want to look at a typical crossover IPO and, and see if there's a good fit with the SPAC and kind of leave their options open because at the end of the day, it's the same investors by and large that are, that are participating in both of these. So, Jonas, yeah, I'm, I, I, think right. I think Jonas is absolutely right. I think that it's already started. I think that, you know, the, the, the inbound inquiries with respect to SPACs at our firm, you know, probably gone up 2,000%. Um, and so, you know, I think that there isn't a, you know, company now who's thinking, you know, about going public that doesn't say, hey, I've heard a lot about SPAC. Is this a, is this a good alternative? Why or why not? And so, you know, whether they dual track it or not, they're definitely inquiring into this product and trying to understand it and see if, it, if this is their path to public. Just in my discussions with, let's call it lay people, uh, they really haven't heard of SPACs. They've heard of IPOs, reverse mergers, kind of self-explanatory. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the history of the broader SPAC market. Um, and, and Jonas, could you help us a little bit more in terms of detail and uh, as far as the types of sponsors outside of healthcare that have been doing SPACs, the size of the deals, the types of companies, um, and, and why therefore that might be a, a, a natural driver for why SPACs eventually took off in, in biotech as well. I mean, yeah, real briefly, SPACs have been around since about 04, uh, 2004, and there was sort of the first wave through the financial crisis, which were more entrepreneurial teams, and um, a number of those were, were nice, successful deals. I think post-financial crisis, there was a little bit of a disruption in the uh, bio, sorry, the overall IPO market, and so um, and not necessarily even in healthcare, I think, you know, everywhere. And so um, a lot of some of the larger PE groups got behind the products so Carlisle and TPG and others. We started seeing some really high quality companies of scale go public through SPACs and, and it kind of built as slowly over the last four or five years and has really taken off this year for a variety of reasons. Um, and so now you're seeing, I mean, this year alone, there's been 40 billion of new issuance and another 11 billion filed. And there are about 130 SPACs out there looking for targets across a lot of different industries. There's, I think there's been 15 biotech SPACs now in the last uh, two, two and a half years. Um, and so there's a lot of momentum behind that. I think it um, has grown because the uncertainty of this COVID environment has really highlighted the, one of the key attributes of a SPAC is that you can confidentially put your deal together, you can size it, you can find your investors, and then you can announce it in a de-risk manner that is um, very difficult to do in a traditional IPO. And that I think is why it's, it's really taken off across a lot of different sectors. You're seeing $4 billion SPACs and some teams doing multiple SPACs at once. And um, there's been a lot of interest around that. Where this will end, will it be filling a need? And there's a lot of supply of interesting companies and a lot of really great teams out there that would be good partners. So I think it's in a, in a good balance right now. Actually. Yeah. And, and one of the things. Oh, yeah, that, sorry. Go ahead. I, I, I was, I was going to say one of the things that we've also seen that, that you asked is we've seen a lot of inbound interest, not only by domestic companies, by foreign companies too. So it's not just a U.S. only sort of product that people are looking at. It's on a global scale. And I was going to point out uh, to what Jonas alluded to, we'll, we'll see how this eventually plays out. There's certainly a lot of enthusiasm now um, around the SPACs, but relative, we've had relatively few um, transactions. Now, the Immunovant Health Sciences transaction was a real winner, um, so I, you know, I I guess in some ways we've contributed to, to the enthusiasm, but I think that over time we'll see what the transactions actually look like and how these deals end up trading. And then the market is going to judge whether this is a, you know, a veritable option uh, for the high quality companies. It certainly is now, but I think that you know, folks need to be disciplined around the targets that they go after and um, still you know, not be... Um, you know, not allow the momentum to, you know, to take over. Yeah, yeah I mean, clearly, ahead, perform so clearly that's an important component. 
Um, and I think it, a lot of the SPAC that we've worked on, Italian and others, and Univan and the rest, they're performing really well and trading really well. So that that's going to help the market. But I agree with Stephanie that you have to continue to be disciplined. And I think the investors need to be disciplined and everybody needs to be disciplined to make sure that the product continues, you know, to flourish as it is, um, especially given the fact that, you know, all the uncertainty, you know, sort of, you know, in the world right now, you know, that's a product, you know, that, that could be there during that uncertainty and, and provide an option for a lot, a lot of target companies that may not necessarily choose um, to go down the traditional IPO route. Yeah, I think Stephanie made an important point is there's, I see two real um, key elements that the SPAC could bring is that there's enough capital to take the company through important value inflection points and so drive returns uh, based off of sound science and diligence, right? And the right investor base and all those things. And then also, in, you know, important is that it, it trades well, which means you appropriately size your transaction. You've been uh, mindful of the valuation and you've built a thoughtful book around it such that it trades well afterwards. Um, because those two go hand in hand. If you have a lot of SPACs that don't trade well, you're going to stop seeing uh, as many of the sort of the leading investors participate in them. So there are a lot of them out there, but you know, the teams are all high quality. Um, and, and so hopefully, um, you know, we can all come with some, some interesting transactions here and, and, and we'll see. So um, in terms of trading, well, I guess people would put different amounts of weight on the importance of sell side research. Um, historically, that was a worry with SPACs, but we're seeing uh, research coverage. What, what, are, what can companies do to ensure uh, a good amount of sell-side research coverage? Jonas, let's start with you, and then Stephanie, it'd be great to hear about how you got there with Immunivant as well, if you were involved. So, I mean, there's, you're likely, so the research coverage is important, and that really comes from relationships from the SPAC, whether from the initial underwriting syndicate or others, and it comes from the target company. Usually they've had some conversations or banking relationships and the like. And so the, um, the research sort of coverage follows either organically once the deal is, is closed or you have conversations with banks and know you're gonna have sort of broader banking support and pull in a group of advisors around the DSPAC. So there's really two approaches to it. You know, I would say, you know, out of the four, only three have closed. So there's not a lot, it's only an end of three right now, but um, you're seeing anywhere from two to six or seven analysts cover. So along the lines uh, of what you get on an IPO. Um, and I think there's a lot of interest now. I know there is from, from lots of banks to try to be involved in the DSPAC. So I suspect that uh, research coverage will be relatively straightforward to kind of bring along on transactions going forward. But that, that's also the role of the, the sponsor and target as part of the transaction. Yeah, it's a whole team effort. It's, it's part of the, you know, part of our job to make sure that we're getting uh, enough eyes onto the company. It's, it's part of the company's job to, to do what they set out to do. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's part of our bankers. It's really a, a team effort. Um, and it helps when, you know, the target company actually delivers on, uh, on what they're doing. So when there's a positive catalyst to report on, then you're going to see a lot of pickup uh, coverage of that from the research analyst. And I think we saw that uh, in the Munivan transaction, right? It was an, an yeah. exciting space. It had banks that were interested to begin with. Um, yeah. There were value inflection points in the not near-term horizon. So banks got uh, involved ahead of that because they were interested in the company. At the end of the day, high-quality companies and high-quality investors would get high-quality research coverage in my opinion. That's right. And, you know, part of uh, what makes a company compelling to us is someone that is bringing something disruptive to the market. So you could almost say that, you know, what they were doing was underappreciated or, or not recognized, um, but we help them bring that forward. And then now, you know, the therapy and, and the novel modality that they're using, which is next generation antibodies, um, has now become sort of, you know, well known across Wall Street. Right. So of late, we have uh, clearly seen um, sponsors in, in biotech SPACs that are sort of the, the well-known funds. Um, so I guess the question is, are we gonna start seeing seasoned executives attempt to follow in the footsteps of these uh, well-known institutional funds? Um, uh, maybe we'll start with Yvonne Claude and head over to Jonas. I think the answer is absolutely. Uh, so, and the reason why I say that, so fully, you know, we, we are sort of embedded in the ecosystem of biotech and tech. Um, and we, you know, if you think about all the 
all the M&A that's occurred sort of in, in, especially in the biotech sector, you have a lot of really good seasoned executives out there looking to do something new. Um, I, I will say that we have had more inquiries from um, teams thinking about, you know, whether or not a SPAC product is something that they want to pursue because they think and they believe that they're going to be able to lend not only their experience um, in, the, in the biotech sector, but also, uh, you know, a track record, but also ability to find really good targets to sort of work with investors that they've worked with before um, to provide value. Um, and so I, I do think that there is a, a wave, and there continues to be a wave as people get more educated with the product, um, to, to, to consider sort of, you know, doing a SPAC. And so we've seen a lot of teams, um, at least at Cooley, you know, considering this product um, very seriously. Yeah, I mean, if you look at other industries, so you've seen uh, institutional funded sponsors, um, you know, uh, back a lot of different SPACs. We've also seen seasoned executives get involved. And so often these are folks that are experts in their field that have been successful, that think they have a, a network of deal flow that would be relevant to the SPAC, and they think that they can bet on themselves and their team to put together an interesting transaction. Um, you know, they aren't easy. I just want to tell everyone that these transactions, you know, do, do involve uh, an overall team and, and pulling the right advisors, and, you know, and, and otherwise along the way to kind of put these together. But I think you're going to see, I'm sure, in the biotech space, season executives that say, look, I've done this before. I'm actually a really valuable partner because I actually have real world operating experience and I can find companies or I know of companies and areas that I know well that, that would want to work with me. And so it's just a question of pulling the other pieces of the transaction together, which is maybe the execution team, maybe the right bank, the right lawyers, and, and capital, um, whether at the out, outset or some, some you know, relationships to, to provide on, on the DSPAC as well. So I, I, I look forward to seeing that happen in biotech. I think it's going to be interesting. I think that the one major challenge for the seasoned executive, um, certainly from a transactional perspective, they can do all of the above. And it's great that they can also bring some of that operational experience to the deal. But I think the challenge is going to be in building that syndicate and then delivering this wonderful prepackaged syndicate um, to the target company. Because those companies are still going to want to see, and this has been evolving as even with our second spec, we decided not to do warrants. Um, so, you know, we're only, we only issue common shares, not units. Um, and that really shaped the investor, the shareholder register into a more fundamental investor base. Um, so we'll see, you know, what kind of investor base and what kind of syndicates they can, they can pull together. I agree with Stephanie. It's not going to be easy. I think you, you will see some folks do it if the other industries are a guide. Um, you know, what you've also seen is some um, funds of backed executives. So you get the experience of the executive with the balance sheet of the and relationships of the funds. So you have seen that in other sectors as well. We, we may see those sort of hybrid relationships, um, you know, time will tell. Got it. I have uh, just a, a couple more questions since we're in the finishing stretch here. But uh, I like to finish uh, some panels by asking each participant to ask a question of another panelist. So please think about that. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead with that towards the end. Um, so I'm just interested in any predictions for the biotech SPAC market in 2021. Let's start with, uh, with uh, Stephanie. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a ton of enthusiasm. There's definitely a huge amount of supply. So there are more great companies that need capital and want to enter the public market uh, ecosystem sooner rather than later. So I think that um, we're definitely sort of on the uplift of, of, that, of that. So I think it's going to grow. Um, and then I think judgment is going <laughs> to follow suit based on the quality of the deals that are done. And Ivan Clark? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I echo what Stephanie said. I mean, I, I think that there have been 2,400 companies around the world that have raised uh, a series C or D round. That, that's a lot of companies that are, um, that are out there. Um, whether or not they all, you know, public traditional way, probably not, you know. But it, at the end of the day, I think that supplies out there, if you're a good fundamental company, you, you can get a deal done. If you want to de-risk your transaction, you know, a SPAC is a, a great alternative. 
I predict you'll see health sciences four by the end of the next year. <laughs> no, I, I mean, maybe we will, but I, I think predictions for 2021, I think there's just too much momentum in biotech that these take, these are forward looking structures. So they take, you know, 12 to 24 months to play out sometimes less, you know, often less, but um, you know, we will continue to see more new issuance, certainly in the biotech space for SPACs. Um, we'll see, you know, how they play out on the back ends. So they're not as easy to get someone to commit to the IPO is a lot easier to get someone to commit to the business combination. And so we have to see some aftermarket performance. Um, and so I, I'll see that play. I'm, I'm optimistic. I think it's here to stay. It'll be an important part of the go public landscape for biotech going forward, but it's going to ebb and flow like every other sector. It's not immune to markets as well. Got it. And, and so I um, wanted to ask each of you a question about what's misunderstood about SPACs based on your conver conversations. It could be hidden value, misunderstandings, but what is it that you have to explain to people over and over? So we'll start here with Yvonne, Claude, go to Stephanie. Oh, sorry, go to Jonas and then finish with Stephanie. No, I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't say misunderstood. I would just say there are a lot of people who don't know what a SPAC is and don't understand the transaction. So once we, you know, educate them on the, the, the SPAC transaction and we work with obviously bankers, the bankers do some education and the investors that are currently in social targets, I think it's very, you quickly, you know, people are smart. They we sort of understand this product. And I think that, you know, I think that, even though in the past, this product may not have been a product that people thought of, you know, early on, just like an ATM, for instance, the ATMs were sort of the same sort of concept where people didn't think of that product. And now it's one of the biggest products around. But I, I just think that at the end of the day, as people learn more and more, is, 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 is great investors um, like Stephanie are, are out there as private equity uh, firms, sponsors look to, 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 to be involved in SPACs. And there have been a lot of really big name companies merging with SPACs. I think the product is, you know, is, is definitely, you know, losing, you know, this concept of, of people not knowing about it. I think, it, you know, I think that we have a, a, a conference ourselves um, on SPACs and, you know, there are thousands of people signed up. I mean, this is a product that people want to learn more about. And I think that, you know, the investor community, you know, is really getting up to speed very quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a nuanced, very flexible product. And so because it's nuanced and not cookie cutter, it takes a little bit more to understand it. And once you've been through a deal or two, whether from the sponsor or underwriter or investor side, it begins to make a lot of sense. If you're target companies, you may not have been through it. So as more and more folks are touched by it, I think it becomes easier for them to understand. I think the other biggest discussion point is people have to wrap their arms around redemptions and how do you, um, how do you understand where you're going to be, like how much money ends up in the transaction and you have to talk about you know, the pipe and the SPAC and who's redeeming, who's not, and how do you backstop it? And there's some other nuances around it because at the end of the day, the company wants to know what, how much money am I getting? Just because I have this amount in the SPAC, what am I left with? And, and you solve that through road showing and commitments from funds. And so that takes a little bit of explaining. So those are usually the two areas of, of most, uh, most explanation from my perspective. Yeah, I think that there were some misconceptions because typically, you know, industrial companies or other sectors where you have a lot of SPACs before the biotech SPACs, um, the difference is that they were profitable companies. <laughs> and the biotech companies that are going public are not profitable typically. And so it's much earlier in their life cycle, but they need to propel themselves forward. And so I think that's a nuance of the difference of, you know, where our companies are. Um, but ultimately, success begets success. So when you see um, deals trade well and you see companies really executing and, and hitting everything that they, you know, they say they're, they're setting out to do, um, the market learns about that very quickly and educates itself. So um, it's no longer viewed as a stepchild to the IPO process. It's a veritable threat to that process and so it's definitely going to be more um, attractive for some companies to to take this path got it and as mentioned i'd like to finish by having each panelist ask a question to another panelist it's in the spirit of not being able to do this uh topic justice in an hour-long period so why don't we start with jonas then stephanie and we'll finish with yvonne claude 
So Stephanie, what are you looking for in a target from health sciences team? Yeah, so, you know, uh, this is what we do every day. We try to identify companies that we think are bringing some disruption and that are going to be transformational to patients. So we're not looking for stories. Uh, we're not looking for momentum plays. We're looking to identify something before the rest of the market appreciates what a company has going on. And um, a lot of what we're doing, spending our time on is in the gene therapy space and RNA medicines. Um, but there are other new emerging technologies that we're very excited about. Um, so I guess you'll, you'll see. <laughs> We've got a couple of exciting companies that um, you know we're we're about to enter discussions with, so stay tuned. Okay. Um, yeah, my question is for Yvonne Claude. So, if a company comes to you and and asks you, you know, to sort of delineate what should they do, um, what are some of the things that would make you, you know, advise your client either one way or another? Or do you think you'd advise them to run a parallel process? It's a good question. I mean, I think it depends where they are in their life cycle. Um, however, you know, one of the first things that we do um, as a law firm is we really try to dig in sort of on the financials and the financial savings center. They prepare from that perspective. I think that to me is a critical thing. One of the things that we recommend, I probably on 100% of all our staff, you know, we always advise our clients, um, number one, to, to sort of talk to bankers who, who understand this product right away. The other thing is, is we also advise clients to hire um, a, a financial consultant that can actually help with, you know, the MDNA process, help with the financial statements, because the, the accounting firm has to remain in the um, and there are issues that sort of come up, especially to the extent that you have warrants and other things with such accounting. Um, and so we always, to me, those are sort of critically important things you need to get ahead of um, in order to be a public company, in order to do a SPAC transaction. So, so to me, those are some critical things. Yvonne Claude, you get to close it out. Final question, please. So I guess my question is for both Stephanie and Jonas. Um, I think, you know, you guys have obviously, you know, were involved in immune and other in the biotech space really sort of taking you know, a real look at this product. And there are all sorts of companies, vaccine, gene therapy, car companies sort of considering SPAC routers or now SPAC. Um, do you think, you know, going forward, given sort of the COVID pandemic, there's going to be more attention um, by investors to focus on investments in this sector? Yeah, I'll jump in um, for sure. So if you think about a lot of the, you know, what we've gone through as a sector since 2016, when healthcare was really destroyed, you had, you know, election headlines were super negative with the drug pricing debate at, you know, top of, top of the news um, every day. And then you had the, the, you know, Valiant crumbled, which destroyed about 90% of their value, and um, every generalist investor that thought that they could invest in healthcare ran for the hills. Um, there was a recovery in 2017, but then things again turned um, south in 2018, and the sector ended down about 10%. Uh, 2019, we had a nice recovery again, and um, you know, and then people sort of thought, well, maybe you know, biotech is back and valuations are high, and then things sold off by another 30% in March of this year um, due to COVID. And so we think that it's really actually underappreciated um, how attractive the valuations were because they really were up and down for the last several years. Um, and we've had a good run the last six months, but part of that is because net flows have finally turned positive. So I think for once, um, the drug pricing debate has been shelved for the time being, and the discussion is more around public health versus drug prices. Um, and we think that, you know, it's great to actually have people look at the industry as a savior instead of a villain. So we're definitely seeing a lot more investor interest um, I would um, follow that and say, there's one thing I can guarantee you in biotech is you're going to get some volatility. So history, as Stephanie just laid out the last few years, you're going to see times when it feels like biotech's never going to look, go down again and other times where you don't know how to pick a valuation for it. 
I'm just going to cash flow method or, or however. Um, but I think that, um, that there is sort of this macro trend now that Stephanie touched upon where healthcare is not the villain. It's actually constructive. It's important. And it's been maybe undervalued by society. And so some of those major headwinds that have caused volatility in the last few years might be abating a little bit especially if we go through, get to the elections and get a sense of where policy could be in the next sort of four plus years. Um, and so if you're long-term in nature and you follow the science and you look for good teams and, you know, maybe you have a SPAC product that works, you know, it's a good place to kind of, um, you know, be patient and, and try to find the right opportunity and be disciplined. Great. Right. Thank you. With that, we'll conclude the session. So thank you to Stephanie, Yvonne Claude and Jonas and special thanks again to Arm for allowing us this forum. Great. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Bola.